We are at the Maine State Library in our public reading room. This is a normal day here at the library. We have patrons doing genealogical research and personal computer use and looking for good books. And we're going into the main author's collection. In the late early 1920s, actually, Henry Dunnock, who was the state librarian at the time, started collecting books by main writers, trying to get them signed whenever possible. And it's grown into this. Um, in fact, we also have an annex to this room. Um, but we have thousands of titles um, by writers who have some connection to the state of Maine. Um, we like to say that Stephen King, the typical Maine writer, has probably about 15 or 20 specific ways he's connected to the state. Mm -hmm. um, birth, education, employment, homes. Um, so if anybody else meets any one of those criteria, for example, his son, Joe Hill, no longer lives in the state of Maine, but we still claim him. Since we've been collecting books since 1836 here at the State Library, we have a number of unique or very rare items. For instance, we have a copy of the first edition of the Book of Mormon, which has been in the State Library um, since approximately 1848. It was published in 1830. Um, the first run was 5,000 copies, and they're only in institutions, there are fewer than 10% of that left. Um, what makes our copy a little bit different is if you come to the Maine State Library, we will pull it out of the safe and let you look at it with gloves mm -hmm. um, because that connection to sacred literature is so important to so many people um, that we think that's something valuable that we can do. We believe in preserving books, but there's no point in preserving them without access. Um, so that's, that's something we do a little bit differently than mm -hmm. other libraries. There is one item that we do not let anybody actually touch, and that's the Martha Ballard Diaries. Marth Martha Ballard was a midwife who lived in Hallowell, Maine, the next town down the river, um, from 1785 to 1812. And she kept a handwritten obviously, diary of her work as a midwife. Um, in the 1970s, Laura Ulrich transcribed the diary and wrote a book based on it called A Midwife's Tale. This is incredible detail, um, who she's talking to, what she's doing. It really brings that time period alive from a woman's perspective, from a healthcare perspective, things that we don't think about. Her perspective is actually interesting in that she's much more free and doing what needs to be done than our imaginations are of, of that time period. We expect women to have been quiet and gentle and in their place, and she's not. She's out there doing her job, um, and she's the doctor. She's taking care of people. Um, it's just a wonderful look at women's history in a way that we don't always do. This isn't Paul Revere. Um, this isn't the revolution, although the revolution, because it's just happened. But it is day-to-day -day life. Um, and that truly is the biggest gem of our collection. But when we talk about the literary history of Augusta, mm -hmm. we're really talking about the magazines published not as so much as magazines as mail order catalogs disguised as magazines. Comfort Magazine was published um, by the Gannett and Morse Company. William Gannett was a entrepreneur and he created something called Giant Oxian. Giant Oxian would cure it. If you had it, it would cure it. It was a br little brown tablet, and you plopped it in water, and drank it, and, and all was made well. It brought comfort to your life. Um, the mail order catalogs of that time were actually magazines. So instead of what we would ex see as the Sears catalog or the the Montgomery Ward catalog, we'd have these magazines full of stories 
And in the stories, you needed to take Oxian, and it would make your life better. Um, in some ways, these are a precursor of social networking. It was a way to bypass advertisers, uh, bypass traditional publishing, and sell your product directly to the market. This was late 19th century through mid early 20th century, 1880s to 1930s. Um, because Maine, particularly Augusta, had access to the pulp and the, to make the paper, um, water and rail transit, um, things were published here. It was made more sense to actually print these periodicals in Augusta and ship them out. Augusta actually has this enormous post office, which is, it's a castle, um, no longer used as the post office. Mm -hmm. the, the current post office is a very small building. But at that time, we were shipping incredible amounts of magazines all over the world. Comfort Magazine um, is the first magazine to reach a million subscribers. We have the complete run. Um, and they've all be, been conserved. Um, we use the NEDCC, the Northeast Document Center, for taking care of them. Um, and they're wrapped in, incredible, in incredible detail uh, to protect them. One layer of paper, another layer of paper, and then a box. Because they were working so hard to say that they were a magazine, not a catalog, um, how the postal shipping rates varied by that. Um, they published news articles. They published biographies of people of the time. Um, the uh, prohibition got started in Maine, and Comfort Magazine was really heavily in, in favor of prohibition. They're selling a cute little drug that makes you feel better. There were lots of articles on prohibition. There were lots of articles on, well, the kinds of things you would see today in the women's magazines like um, Good Housekeeping. Um, but easily 80% of it was advertising at any one time. And one of the things they did was they would, uh, free, everything was free if you um, got more subscribers to Comfort Magazine. Um, or if you bought this thing, you get that thing for free. It was just all advertising. It circulated all over the country. Um, in fact, the, mo the state that had the single most subscriptions was California. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, its success was the reason it failed. When the postal rates, they, they changed um, from a straight rate to a regional rate, mm -hmm. um, it became entirely too expensive to mail something from Augusta to California. Um, so that made, that made a huge difference, and that's eventually what killed it. The other interesting thing I wanted to mention today was Myron Avery. Myron Avery, the history of the, of the Appalachian Trail and Myron Avery are completely intertwined. You wouldn't have the trail without Avery. Benton McKay was the person who said, wrote an article in the 1920s saying there should be a trail that you could walk from Georgia to Maine to see the whole country. Um, Myron Avery is the person who went out and built the trail, who walked it. He was the first person to actually walk the length of the, the trail. He was a Maine native, born in Lubeck. Um, his family background was in sardine canning, which of course was a huge industry in Maine in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, but he loved the woods. He became a, an attorney and a captain in the Navy and did admiralty law for a living, and, but spent, according to one source, up to 50 weekends a year working on the trail. He was headquartered in Maryland, and so he, he founded the Potomac Appalachian Club and was president of that group. Um, the trail wouldn't exist without him. Um, he died unexpectedly uh, at the age of 52 and had arranged to leave his papers to the Maine State Library 
unfortunately, because of the untimeliness of his death, none of it was organized. And we're still trying to get a really good handle. There are thousands of pictures that he took or that his friends took um, of things happening at the state along the trail as he was building it. Um, some of them are incredibly fun. There's a, a photograph of an old man, and, it, and it's titled Old Man Byron, and standing in a farm. And then the next shot is where the trail will go through the farm. Avery said he couldn't have built the farm, the trail, without the cooperation of the landowners. Um, and he had really good relationships with landowners across Maine to get access, across the country, to get access to where the trail is now. Um, this is especially exciting because it's the 75th anniversary of the trail's completion this last August. In addition to photographs, um, a dam under construction, um, a camp for sale, um, the camp is in fine condition. And, and there are, people are still camping at Mount Katahdin and in the, the area. Um, he wrote on all of the photographs what they were about. This, this is Myron Avery, and he is on the back of a truck going between spots for the trail building. Most of these photographs were taken in 1920s. Okay. Um, and what I found interesting was, again, there were far more women, uh, particularly with the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club, who were actually out there blazing trails and um, helping build the trail. For most through hikers who hike the whole trail in one at a time, they start in Georgia and they end in Maine. Um, because of the, the way the seasons run, you can get started in March in Georgia and finish up in September, October in Maine. You can't start in Maine until June. This is Myron Avery's book booklet about the Appalachian Trail. It is absolutely wonderful and the opening paragraph is delightful. Through somber hued spruce and fir forests, across the depths of the Maine wilderness with its cathedral-like stillness, unerring in its course as a driven arrow, lies a silvered isle, the gateway to the finest of Maine's mountains, lakes, forests, and streams. With Maine's poet, those who travel this course of peace, beauty, and solitude may indeed feel that this is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks, bearded with moss and in garments green, indistinct in the twilight.